Uh, first of all, I always start by saying I'd like to thank PCCGB, the Photographic Collectors Club of Great Britain, for the invitation to address them on this particular interesting topic. Very interesting to me because I've been collecting cameras, Leica cameras with British lenses for some time now. And um, this is about something that happened at a point in time, but I want to address it in a linear fashion as to what was there before and what happened afterwards and what the effect of these uh, conversions and lenses were. To start, um, we go back to the 19th century and uh, the way the cameras were back then. You could interchange lenses. You generally interchange lenses in order to cover a, a larger plate size. And uh, in this particular case here, you see a camera, which is actually a quarter plate camera, which is three and a quarter by four and a quarter. But in fact, the lens on it is actually for a three and a quarter by three and a quarter uh, plate for uh, magic lanterns. And you would you would often find, I, I'm cataloging at the moment, a collection of cameras and lenses that goes back to the 1850s. <laughs> and you will often find at the back that there is a pencil drawing of a smaller plate size on the back. Uh, this one uh, has one particular feature here. It has a shutter as well as on the lens board. And this means that, again, the changing lenses would have been a somewhat difficult process. The lenses uh, back then were typically focused with a box or a bellows in order to move the lens in and out as compared to the, the plate plane as it was originally and subsequently film plane. Uh, the, these are two lenses made in Dublin by my friend, Mr. Grubb. Uh, the one on the left is actually, uh, it's actually fixed. It doesn't actually focus. Uh, the top goes in and out to increase uh, or decrease the plate size because the stops were in the top. The one on the right has a helicoid, which is very interesting. It's from the 1850s. But typically helicoids were not really used until the dawn of the 20th century. So we're getting closer to the time of the Leica here, and we're talking about a German camera, in this case, the Gors Anschutz, sometimes known as the Ango, which was available from 1894 onwards. It had a bellows, but the bellows were for folding. The focus was actually through a helicoid on the lens at the front. And then the other important feature, which had been introduced at around this time, was that the shutter was on the focal plane which was a feature of the Leica, and this freed up the front of the camera. Uh, this camera, you could uh, interchange the lenses and you could also do tilt and shift with it. Moving on to a man called Oscar Barnack, and this is where the Leica story begins. Oscar Barnack joined uh, Lights at around 1910 or 1911. He was a man of poor health, but great skill. He was an engineer and he had worked with Zeiss. He did is in some of his initial testing with this large camera at the back here, which is a nettle camera. It has a focal plane shutter, uh, but it still has focus through a bellows. But you could interchange the lenses. His objective, however, was to achieve what was in front of this, which was his Klein film or Lilliput camera. Klein film meaning small film, and what his objective was to use the 35 millimeter mm. film that was uh, typically used uh, in cine or movie cameras. And this particular lot, these two cameras, are the most expensive lot of cameras ever sold. It's sold for 14.4 million in 2022, and I was at the auction. Going back a bit to 1914, he produced this camera, and this is probably, if it were ever sold, and it will never be sold, it's probably the most valuable camera in the world, and you can only guess at what the, the value of it might be if it, were, if it were ever sold. It is the Ur Leica, which means the original or primeval Leica. It's a 35 millimeter prototype. It was not the first 35 millimeter camera. There were other cameras produced by companies in Germany, France, United States with 35 millimeter before this camera was produced. There was even one produced by CP Gores, who I mentioned there a minute ago. This one had a focal plane shutter and it had a fixed lens. And this is important to note because when we come in here on this and the focus mount that was produced, it was a 42 millimeter F 
micro or micro summer. <laughs> if there's any German friends on, they can correct my pronunciation. The micro summer was designed for photomicrography and was focused through a microscope. It did not have focusing elements itself, except it had a small helicoid at the back for mounting. It was f4.5 lenses and it had a number of stops. What Barnack did was he put it onto a brass focusing mount, which is on the front of the Earl Leica. I'm not sure if this has been opened in recent years. I know that Malcolm Taylor did some work on the camera when he was working on Barnack's cine camera. But uh, Ulf Richter says it might be uh, damaging to what's inside to actually open it. And Ulf has written a great book on uh, Barnack from the idea to the Leica. Uh, and I had the privilege of meeting Ulf at the Leica archive last October. So here we have the beginnings of a focusing mount uh, for a lens. By the way, there's some speculation about the focal length of the lens as to they had uh, these micro summers in 24, 42 and 64. Some people say it was be because the diagonal on the 24 by 36 format adopted by Barnack was uh, 42 that was used. But I, I certainly suspect it was because the, it was the one that fitted the image that he wanted to create on the 35 millimeter film the best. Rolling on into the 1920s, a lens was created. It was initially called the Anastigmat. It was a 50 millimeter lens, initially five elements, uh, created by Barnack along with uh, Max Barek, who was his chief uh, lens designer. It had a number of features which are important to note going forward. Number one, it had a screw mount to actually go into the body of the camera. It had a helicoid inside the barrel and it was also collapsible. And it was of infinitely better quality than the micro Samar. So this anastigmat lens was used as a fixed lens in various prototypes, most notably the legendary zero series cameras. In this particular case, uh, you'll notice that the camera has a, a lever uh, for the lens focusing. It is then screwed into the body and then the internal helicoid takes it in and out. It is also collapsible. And the other feature to note here is the lens cap on a string, which was there because it, the shutter was non-self-capping. So th these are the legendary cameras which sell for multi-millions of pounds. There was only 22 of them ever made. They were not sold. They were given out for testing and then returned to the factory. By 1926, things had, had settled down. The camera was introduced in 1925, initially with the Anastigmat, then with the LMAX, and people beat themselves up and pay huge sums of money to get the early lenses. The lens that eventually became the lens that made Leica, and that was the permanent lens with the four element Elmar. It, it was similar in design to the earlier lenses and it had similar features. This is a, a Leica from 1926 in my collection, one, number 1783. It has uh, all the features of a Leica from that time. One of the first features that you'll notice on the left hand side is a thing called what is called a hockey stick. And that is for the infinity stop. And then if you turn around anti-clockwise to the minimum focus, it will hit a little screw. In order to change out that lens, you have to remove that screw. So therefore you'll see at this stage, you're talking still about a fixed lens camera, 50 millimeter, where it would have been difficult to have changed the lenses. In addition to that, there was a further issue. And that was that each lens had to be matched uh, to each camera. And how this was done was that little hole in the back, uh, there's a bung in that, that was taken out and a ground glass screen was held up against the back, just like the 19th century cameras. And the technician then put shims, which are thin metal rings in behind the mount in order to match the 50 millimeter lens uh, to the camera. I once had the misfortune, uh, I was shooting with Leica number 1661 from 1926 when uh, all of the shims popped out from behind the mount and I had to reassemble them. They actually fell onto gravel, but I still managed to get them all back in and to take a photograph, which was a minor miracle. 
from 1925 onwards, um, we're going to talk about what happened in Britain. Uh, Britain was obviously a market um, that uh, Leica was uh, wanted to uh, basically exploit. Um, the advertisement, which is here, is in fact the uh, very first advertisement in English for a Leica camera. And it was issued by Ogilvy and Company at 20 Mortimer Street in London. They were at the time also dealer for other makes, as indeed were most camera dealers in London at that time. Uh, there were dealers for Frank and Heidi. You'll see the Heidescope stereo reflex camera there. However, a couple of years later, lights had taken over the firm at the same address. And lights basically distributed from there to uh, dealers. In fact, uh, I have evidence that they distributed to Pollux, the Dublin dealer. They would have also just distributed to Sinclair, who I'm going to talk about, and other uh, Leica dealers within Britain. They also had, by this stage, a, a wider range of uh, lights apparatus, which are listed down below. So they had feet on the ground at around 1928, 1929, when the things I'm about to discuss were happening. In 19, late 1920s, a man in London called Albert Brecht Oscar Roth, who had uh, was the agent for Meyer lenses and a number of other products, started putting the Meyer Kino Plasmat 1 and 5 8 inch F1.5 lens onto Leica's. This is about a 41 millimeter lens, not far off the 42 millimeter as originally used by uh, Barnack. Some say that um, uh, Roth works in cooperation with lights. Um, and it was also said that Lights was worried that Zeitz was about to launch an interchangeable lens camera, which they didn't do for several years later uh, with the contacts. Uh, the interesting thing is that this lens here was actually designed by an ex Zeiss person. That's Dr. Paul Rudolph, who's one of the most famous optical scientists of all time when it comes to cameras. He had created the Anastigmat and the Tesser earlier. And he had left Zeiss and had joined up with Hugo Meyer and created this extremely fast lens. This camera, however, is not an original uh, one Model A from 1928 or 1929. It's actually a Leica one Model C from 1930, which seems to have been modified again in 1931 with the new standardized mount with the zero on the top. I, I will speak to this mount uh, later on in the talk. In addition, uh, we note that the lens, the Meyer lens here, actually has a, a rangefinder cam on it, which means that it's from at least 1932, 1933 onwards. The conversions uh, which were done by Roth basically had um, a camera which was described as a multi-exposure focal plane camera, but it's obviously a Leica in this particular advertisement. It was very expensive with this lens on at £39, more than twice the price of the camera with the fixed Elmar lens. Um, but in a later advertisement, and I want to apologise for this, and uh, this advertisement, you'll find it difficult to read. I found this in an article from LHSA Viewfinder magazine from 1970. And in the, the short article, there was this advertisement and I had to cut it out. And it, this is as good as I can actually get it to look like. Here it shows Roth advertising a range of lenses, not just the Meyer plasmat lens, but also uh, two Meyer telemigor lenses. And they were Anastigmat F4 lenses. And one was four inches, which is 100 millimetres, and the next one was six inches, which is 150 millimetres. They were quite expensive for those days at £20, 10 shillings and £24, 10 shillings each. And there was a tubular finder as well. Now, one thing is not clear from this advertisement because it is rather unclear is it says an interchangeable focusing mount, whether this was the existing mount on the uh, one model a or was it the standardized mount which was introduced subsequently the one thing i do note with this particular uh, image here is that there is a hockey stick on the uh, camera which indicates that it's probably a one model a you can just about make it out there on the left side of the camera 
So here's another conversion. Uh, it's a Leica 1 Model A with a Ross Tele Ross 4 inch. Again, that's 100 millimeter f5.5 lens. One of the features here, which we're going to talk a little bit about, is the swing mask, which is on the viewfinder, which was designed for a 50 millimeter lens, and it was reduced to half for the 100 meter, uh, 100 millimeter lens. Uh, interesting point from an Irish viewpoint is that Ross, uh, by the time this happened, was chaired by uh, Sir Charles Parsons, the inventor of the steam turbine and the son of the Earl of Ross, who built the world's largest telescope in Burr County, Offaly, in the 1840s. And in, in another happenstance, which has an Irish connection, three years later, he uh, lined up with Har Grubb, the son of Thomas Grubb, who built those lenses that I showed you earlier. So slight Irish connection here. I always look for them everywhere you go. I have one of these lenses and I'll show you later on a photograph taken with one. In this particular case, the camera is a non-standardized one model A conversion. It is clearly a one model A from the mushroom button, which is on it, but it was converted uh, presumably from after 1930 uh, to that. And quite a few of the conversions that you find with uh, these early British lenses have been converted to the uh, either the non-standardized or more more often the standardized mount M39 mount and I will discuss that and go into that in some detail. What is rare are examples of the camera which was the one model A with uh, British lenses on them and um, I recently acquired one so we're going to go into that in some detail. But before that, I just want to show you some of the features of the Ross conversion. Um, this is the one, a one model A. It's a close focus one model A. This photograph, I cannot make it any better. So I, I apologize for it, but it's from the book by Angela von Einem on the various classifications of the one model A. And there were up to nine of them or 10 of them that she, that she described. In the book, a lot of people think a one model A is a one model A. Well, it's not. They changed the camera a lot in a very short period of time. On the left hand side, you'll see the Ross lens and an interesting little feature there with pointed out on an arrow, which is a dot for aligning it when it's put onto the camera mount. That's something we still have today. And we'll come back to that a few times. And there's a similar dot, except a red one on this time on the Elmar. You'll notice that there, it's got a quite a long screw in thread and we we'll go into this in some more detail as well, because this was a a close focus uh, feet scale lens, which required quite a deep uh, mount. And then the final detail to notice here, I mentioned the swing mask the last time. In this particular case, the swing mask is a clip on swing mask and it was made available by Ross to go with the four inch lens. So now we're moving on to a company called Sinclair. And Sinclair were like a dealers, but they dealt in all different manner of cameras and makes. And uh, they're based in the center of London. This is a Sinclair conversion set of a one model A with a 50 millimeter Elmar, which is on the left, and a Delmar four inch lens, which is on the camera. And both the lenses and the camera were modified. And I'm able to go into some detail with this because I actually have one of these. This is my Sinclair conversion camera with, and I have to say this, it's a Dalmar Dalon Tele Anastigmat 4 inch f5.6 lens, which is quite a mouthful. And it has a swing mask on the viewfinder. So how is this attached to the camera? Well, through a long thread screw mount, any of you that are familiar with the LTM mount will see, will see that that is much longer and, and, um, and length compared to the typical LTM mount. Uh, this is actually a close focus camera, which would have increased the length required as well. This one focused down to one and a half feet with its Elmar lens. Not, not with the Anastigmat lens. It might say that the minimum focus on this one is six, is eight feet on the, on the Ross it was six feet. So here's a comparison between the screw treads on the early Sinclair conversions and the on the left and on the right, you have uh, an example. I have both of these lenses are in my collection of the lens in the LTM M39 mount. And again, we'll go into these mounts in some detail. Uh, 
but you'll actually see that on the left, it's much deeper, but it's also narrower. It's 33 millimeters diameter. The one on the right is 39 millimeters in diameter. So there you see the difference in mount sizes for the one Model A and the standard clearly visible. The, ca the camera on the left is a one Model A and it is 33 millimeter diameter. On the right, you have the very familiar to all of you, uh, 39 millimeter uh, standardized mount. Another feature which came in here, I mentioned the dots on the Ross lenses. Here we have arrows to make an alignment. And uh, the, in this particular lens, because it was a close focus one, it was around eight o'clock for the mount. So you had to actually match these two uh, together in order to get the correct register and to get the lens uh, correctly mounted onto the camera. This is a feature which we have today. Match dot to dot, which are bayonet lenses, which are interchangeable SLRs, DSLRs, EVF cameras, all of that. Still, still around today, uh, almost a hundred years later. This is where it started. One feature which is here, it's kind of difficult to see, but uh, as well as the serial number for the lens, uh, there's also the serial number of the camera on the lens, which means that the camera and the lens were matched. The number 14225, which is the number of the camera, is, is on the lens barrel. This was a feature which was later adopted by Leica themselves. And we'll go into this again in some detail. Here from Angela von Einem's book is the full conversion set. In this case, with a normal focus down to three feet, feet scale mount on the camera. There you'll see on the left arrows pointing to the arrows which were used for alignment for both the Elmar and for the Elmar lens. And you'll also see the swing mask there. So this is what was being done by Sinclair. Just also probably done by Sinclair is this anastigmat here, which is LTM mount, which is also my collection. By 1930, Leica had introduced a range of what were known as torpedo viewfinders, uh, starting with the Visor. This is a VDOM from 1933 onwards, and the camera is a Leica standard, which would have been introduced from 1932 onwards. And um, they, these have settings for all the available Leica lenses. And the nearest one to the Anastigmat is the 10.5 uh, centimeter uh, Mountain Elmar F3.6 lens. And you'll see one of those later on. It, it rather resembles, in fact, uh, this particular lens. So the advertising, one of the, one of the difficulties about researching something like this is that you're not going to get the correspondence of the books of our friends in Sinclair or whether or not they were coordinating with the lights people in Wetzlar. It, it, it is very, all you can do is get uh, either the cameras uh, as physical evidence and the period advertisements. In this particular case, this advertisement is from around 1929, possibly 1930. And it says a vest pocket telephoto lens for your like a camera and it, it, it advertising the fact it was very small. It was also relatively cheap compared to what you got from Rot with the Meyer lens. It was only six guineas, six pounds, six shillings. It, it mentions here some of the features that it was light and weight, which is absolutely correct about how you mounted the lens uh, using the red arrows. That's also mentioned here. And the, the, it says the lens is set for infinity when, when matched. The lens is actually focused through the lens itself. In other words, it has internal focusing and you use the scale on the lens. There is on the mount on the camera a, a scale, but that's only used for the Elmar lens. Interesting little story about this. When I acquired some months ago uh, my Sinclair conversion camera, I knew that at home, that I actually had a Sinclair engraved base. And uh, I just simply swapped it from the other camera, which was a 1929 Leica One Model A onto this one. So I, ha I have it with the complete Sinclair engraving, which amazed Lars Netable from whom I bought the camera. What had happened was that in 1929 or 30, the address changed from 9 and 10 Charing Cross to 3 Whitehall. 
The shop didn't move, but the address was changed by London City Council. So I'm very pleased to actually have the engraving as well. D these, these kind of little details are important to collectors. I have another Dalmar lens on the Leica. In this case, interestingly, uh, this is a standardized Leica 1 Model A with a C-mount Dalmar popular 3-inch F4 lens, which was produced for Cine, and it's on an LTM mount. And there is one issue with the uh, this, this particular mount, which is that the C-mount is 25.4 millimeters as opposed to 39 millimeters on the standardized like amount. And therefore, there's the possibility of vignetting. Uh, I did take a photograph with it using this. I, I use a Leica M10 and use the rear screen. The lens is not coupled. And I got this image here. You will see a tiny bit of vignetting. Personally, I don't mind vignetting. And you can fix this in five seconds in Lightroom. It's, it's not a problem anymore once, once you create a digital image. But uh, it was it's actually it was actually quite well handled in whoever had done the mount back many, many years ago, over 80 years ago, presumably. Here's an image taken with the Ross Teleross four inch uh, lens. It has even better bokeh in, on it uh, because it's 100 millimeter rather than 75 millimeter, which is what the three inch lens would be. And I use the rear screen for focus again. And again, the lens is not coupled. But you will see then that the lenses are act they're actually as good as any contemporary Leica lens from, from that time, or lights lens, should I say correctly. So in 1930, Leica introduced the One Model C with a, a wider mount. Um, there, was a re there, there were some reasons for this, and um, it, it, it's, it's also not as deep as the, that for the One uh, Model A. There are some details about this, uh, which guys, um, some guys like to stand around all day discussing, which is that it used the British tread pitch of 26 turns per inch and Whitworth profile. And this was probably influenced uh, following a debate which was on the Leica forum. We determined that this was probably influenced by manufacturing considerations and the machines which Leica had. Uh, the 39 millimeter diameter was probably influenced by the new lens range. On the outside, this is 45 millimeters across, and that is what the width was of the new 135 millimeter Elmar lens. So like I had a new range of lenses coming and it needed to expand the amount. Knowing Leica, knowing our friend Barnack, knowing Barak, uh, knowing about Zulki, who was the head foreman there, knowing what I also know uh, about um, Willem Albert, who was uh, Barnack's right-hand man, everything was done well in advance, probably while the British were still doing their modifications because they planned everything ahead. Now, one of the features that they still had to deal with in 1930 when they launched, and by the way, all of this is relevant to the British conversions, in case you think I've gone off, off piste here. Um, these, this is very relevant to, to where things led to from the British conversions was that they had to match the lenses uh, to the camera still. They still didn't have a standardized width uh, of the, um, of the, between the flange and the film plane. So what they did uh, then was they matched uh, the lenses to the camera as heretofore through the little hole in the back. And what they did was the, with the match lenses that they put these numbers on them. And in this case, what they, they have done in this case is they've taken the last three digits of the serial number of the camera 585. There is an example of where they use the full five digits. And I'll show that to you later. In this case, a 35 millimeter is there and it's obviously matched. It's likely that they didn't use the shims, but that they use uh, adjustments to the mounts of the individual lenses because you could match one lens, but matching three lenses together would have been difficult. So here in, and uh, these two photographs are from uh, Jim Lager's book on uh, cameras. Uh, the, all the match lenses in the set had the same uh, numbers. And in this case, the last three numbers in the camera 585. Now, where have we seen this before? We saw that on the Dalmar lens, which was done before these were done. So in other words, a practice had started uh, in with particularly with the Sinclair conversions um, that they had actually the matching numbers on the lens and on the camera. In 1931, 
And I'd like to remind you at this point in time, the Leica had only been on the market for six years. You think back six years, whether there have been any great developments in digital cameras, the answer is probably not. Whereas Leica was introducing this at what was rocket ship pace for that for those times. So they introduced the standardized mount with zero marked and had a standard distance of 28.8 millimeters from the flange to the film plane. And the cameras and the lenses were adjusted accordingly. So therefore, any camera with a zero, you could mount any lens with a zero on it and they would be matched. They continued using the zero on the lenses up to about World War II, I think on the cameras were slightly longer. But this was a remarkable development back then by Leica. And it was one which basically influenced camera manufacturers for generations to come, even to the present day. You know with your L mount or your F mount or your Z mount or your K mount, whatever, that you're getting, you're getting a camera and a lens which will match one another when you buy them. It all started here. Kits needed cases. And this is another thing that happened then. I, I'm not sure how good this actually was, ultimately. Leica introduced these lovely cases. They're like a leather attache cases. I have one from 1930. It's an Etgam case, and it has its original key in it, believe it or not. It looks definitely looks like a period piece. And um, in this particular case, you'll see a one model C, non-standardized, and you will see the five-digit number 37380. I know it's probably difficult to see on screen, but I can assure you that they're there. I often wonder whether this was a good thing. We all go out every day. We go out for, for taking photographs with too many lenses. I often go out with a standard lens, a, 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 a wide angle, and also a telephoto. And what happens is that I never change the lens. I just come back with the same lenses in the bag. Continuing this absolutely remarkable pace by Leica. In 1932, the two Model D arrived with a built-in rangefinder with coupling and cams on the lenses for focusing. And here is some examples from my collection. Here on the left is a lens known as a Fat Elmer. It's an, a 90 millimeter f4 lens, and that would have a cam for rangefinder focusing. Likewise, in the middle, I mentioned this lens earlier, how it resembles some of the British lenses. That's the 105 millimeter f6.3 mountain Elmar, which was a lightweight lens for mountain climbing and uh, hiking. On top of the camera, you'll see the VDOM viewfinder, which has the focal lengths of all of these lenses. Then on the left side, uh, on the right side, you have the 50 millimeter Elmar. And then on the far right, you have a 35 millimeter Elmar. You notice that both of those still have the distance scale on, on a plate which sits up against the mount. So this was announced in 1932 as a camera with automatic focusing, not the autofocus that we have today, but it was again a remarkable development. Kodak had cameras back in the teens of the 1900s, uh, which had a sort of a built in range finder. But uh, it was um, it, it was uh, this this was something on a completely different level because you could use it with different lenses. So the final touch was around cam wheel for focus, which was um, introduced at the same time. So here you had the full like a kit and caboodle by 1932, which was seven years after the camera was introduced. And you still have the same basic thing today, apart from the thread mount. That's a remarkable uh, pace of development. Uh, Barnack and his team were remarkable people. They tested and retested everything. Uh, there are papers inside. If you read Ulf Richter's book, uh, Oscar Barnack, From the Idea to the Like, you'll see a lot of papers from foremen to inside into Barnack, where they had tested the lenses and what was the ideal focal length and all of that sort of thing. It, 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 it was a, a, just a remarkable achievement to actually achieve that in seven years. So how did this affect the British converters and the British lenses? We're coming back to it now. So we, we've gone through a period of change. Now, the first thing that uh, Dalmeyer and Ross uh, and uh, Sinclair and the various other people involved in Britain had to do was they basically had to go with the flow with what Leica had done and go with the new mount size, the M39. 
This is an advertisement uh, for the four-inch Delmar, no, sorry, four-inch Ross lens from um, 1937 in the British Journal Almanac. And uh, they were still providing hinge finder masks. It's not clear if this was also a range finder uh, linked. Uh, it, it's possible there was. It says here mounted in focusing settings. And anyone that has any information out there, feel free uh, to come back to me. I want to thank our chairman, Tim Goldsmith, who's on here this morning, uh, for giving this to me during the week. Uh, this is an item which is coming up to Chiswick Auctions, with whom Tim is associated uh, shortly. It's an LTM M39 mount, 12 inch, that's 300 millimeter F4.5 telephoto from, I would say, the late 1930s, 37, 38. It's mounted onto a Leica 3, which is from sometime up to about 30, 1935 and 1936 because it's in the black and nickel finish. This lens is a, te is a couple lens, and it but it has a direct viewfinder on the mount. Tim also kindly sent me an advertisement from the Dalmar catalog, which you won't be able to read on screen, but I can tell you that it shows a range of lenses for Leicas and with coupling indicated in some cases. And one thing to note on the picture on the top, which is the 12 inch lens, is that it actually has a tripod bush on the, on the lens mount itself, which was a fairly obvious thing to introduce, but uh, because this is a very heavy lens sitting on a very small camera. The British production continued on into after World War II, and this is one of my favourites, a stewartry lens, but it's actually not a stewartry lens, um, but it has a mount which says made in Scotland. So what was behind that? Well, in fact, the lens is a 105 millimeter F3.5 Trinol lens made by the National Optical Company of Leicester. But the couple mount was added uh, by Montgomery's of Glasgow. And they also put Leica and Contax mounts onto Ross Express lenses. So remember, we had Ross lenses back in the 1920s. Here we have from 1946 mounts being put on Ross lenses for Leicas and for Contax. Uh, and they were coupled and they were coated. And they, it's again hard to read these, but there's two nine centimeter lenses of f3.5 and one fast f2 7.5 centimeter coupled for Leica. One of the reasons probably why they were able to get into this business and put those mounts on up in Glasgow and actually have a market for the products was that after World War II, Leica products were in short supply. That's number one. And then there were import quotas and taxes and other issues. So for a while after World War II, again, British lens manufacturers had a little bit of a field day, but it was only short lived because there are none of them still around today. Apart maybe from Cook for the cinema for very expensive lenses. So to wrap up the story, in 1954, Leica introduced the bayonet mount with the M camera. And this had a combined range finder and multiple views um, using uh, frames. So in other words, you can actually see what it was for a 90 or 135 or for a 50. However, there's one feature here to note. See the red dot on the mounting, on the mount, on the left side of the mount. Where did you see that before? Well, that started all the way back in the 1920s with the Ross lens. And that's where you started uh, to produce the proper register. And there was a matching red dot on the lens. And you will find that with any Leica M sold today. So in other words, the basic and the base, that basic design, that's the other thing about Leica, it's longevity. Not only um, do we have features which were introduced in the 1920s, but we also have uh, something that somebody can look at that and look at a modern, let's say, like M10 or M11 and say they're the same camera or they're made by the same people. So by way of summary, uh, the original British conversions were only around for a very short period, but at the time they were absolutely groundbreaking. Um, we feel, at least I certainly feel, that the lights firm 
they must have known about the British uh, experimenters because they were dealing with the London Centre at 10 Mortimer Street and uh, the London headquarter and the London dealers were involved. Uh, Leica introduced a, a larger diameter mount very quickly in the 1930s and this was eventually standardised. And the British uh, made lens manufacturers had to follow on on that very, very quickly. Uh, in other words, in order to stay in the market because the new cameras, uh, modifying one Model A's was only going to go so far. However, from a collector's viewpoint, finding an original one mo Model A conversion is difficult. I would compare them to finding the skin on hen's teeth. <laughs> the features carried through by Leica, however, included the matching numbers on the body, the swing masks for a, for a short period. And then finally, the most long lasting uh, thing that was introduced by the British uh, converters was the matching red arrows and the dots for mounting. So what Leica did in the early 1930s has dictated what we have today with photographers carrying kit bags full of lenses. I, I don't know whether that was a good or a bad thing, but whoever, what the British conversion people did, uh, that actually fed into that process. So, and finally, I just want to say, uh, before I thank a few people, um, that the British lenses were excellent and they stand up to quality expectations as you saw from the two images, which I showed. I just want to thank a few people here because I've used images and uh, used material from people. I want to thank my good friend, Jim Lager, who is one of the best known uh, authors on all things like uh, my friend in Scotland, uh, Paul K. F. R. P. S. Tim Goldsmith for his very recent, and thank you, Tim, for that. You really filled out what, what was a gap. Light photographic uh, option from whom I've b bought three of my uh, British lens Leica's. Let's start camera option from whom I got my Sinclair conversion. And of course, the man there who's a very good friend of mine, Lars Nettable, who's an, also an expert on all things Leica. If Jim Lager ever asked him a really difficult question, uh, he always asked me to ask Lars. Uh, Angela on Van Einem for the two photos from her book. Ulf Richter, I took some photos from, from his book. Uh, his book is called Barnack from the Idea to the Leica. And uh, there is a translation of that in, in English uh, done by Rolf Frick, uh, published by Leica Society International, where I'm on the board, and to David Gardner and, and to others. So here you have a linear progression going all the way. I suppose I've taken you all the way from the 19th century up to the present. Uh, the important thing is that what was done back then in the 1920s and early 1930s by both British converters and also uh, by Leica has fed into what we know and appreciate today. So thank you for listening.